This interview is for the Library of Congress Veterans War Project and looks at life on the home front. <sighs> okay. Okay, shall we start again? Sure. Oh, wait, you already started? Yeah. I'm sorry. Whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. This interview is for the Library of Congress Veterans War Project and looks at life on the home front. Today is Wednesday, September 19, 2007, and uh, we are in the studio of WILL in Urbana, Illinois. Linda, Linda Lou Ficklin Web Weber is the subject of this interview. My name is Harriet Williamson. Also in the studio is Marty Hodges, who is the, the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Uh, Linda, could you talk about where you were born and um, a little bit about your family and your your early life? I was born in Columbia, Missouri, and grew up there until I went to junior high, and then we moved to Boonville, Missouri, which was 20 miles west, and I graduated from high school there. My my father was a school teacher in the high school where I was, and um, he did work at one point for help building a military camp in Warrensburg, Missouri, as a summer job. And so he was gone all summer. And I had a mother and a, two sisters and a brother. And my brother um, served in the Army later, and he was two years younger than I, and he served in the Army, and then uh, took the test for West Point and was appointed to West Point with an Army appointment. Mm -hmm. And um, Are you the oldest? I'm, I'm the two. oldest. Mm -hmm. And then you have two sisters and is, your, is it two sisters and then a brother? No, it's, it's uh, I was the oldest and my brother was two years younger and my sister was four years younger. Mm -hmm. and then I had a baby sister that was 20 years younger. So Now was your family, do you think, affected at all by the Depression? Yeah. In what ways? My, um, my, we, my parents had bought a little house in Columbia, and I think their house payment was 60 and my dad made $80 a month or something like that, and it was pretty impossible, and then the Depression hit. And that would have been in about, that would have been about in 29 or 30, and they lost the house. Mm -hmm. And I know the year that we moved to Boonville, which was, I've forgotten now, but I was going into junior high, and I know our Christmas was very, very simple. Mm -hmm. and, and that was because that was right after they lost the house. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, my parents didn't have any money for a long time. My dad was a school teacher, and they weren't well paid anyway, and mom stayed home, and um, um, and they had lost the house, so they paid rent. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, yes, it very much affected our family. I have pictures. I, I started to bring one of my parents and, and their siblings that look like Dust Bowl people. <laughs> you know, like you've seen the, sort of the people out in the Dust Bowl at that time. And so even in Missouri, I think there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. When did you become aware that there were clouds on the horizon regarding the possibility of war, either in Europe, Asia, and the possibility that the United States would become involved in the war? I don't think I really, I was like 13, 14, and I don't really remember much, although I must have known something because I knew the Japanese ambassadors were in Washington before Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. trying to talk to the president. And I don't, unless that came out later, but I, that really stuck in my mind. And, and I don't know that I even knew anything much about the Holocaust. I remember the day of Pearl Harbor, we were in the car going to my grandmother's and we had a radio in the car and they announced it and it was momentous. But that's probably about the first that I really realized mm -hmm. something was wrong. Mm -hmm. When you were in school during the war, was your school affected by any wartime activities? Do you, you know, were, were classes changed or 
was there a shortage of teachers or not that I remember yeah. any of it it was it was a high school of about 400 so mm -hmm. it probably wasn't impacted too much mm -hmm. I think we had one the music teacher I think went off to war mm -hmm. and then of course as each as we as we graduated, the, the boys all went off to the war, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I remember about that time is that we had a lot of German farmers in the area around town, and people would write nasty things on their barns, paint graffiti on their barns about go back Nazi or something, although they weren't Nazis. They mm -hmm. were they were immigrants who'd, who were farming in the area, but they were German and some of them, probably first or second generation German. Mm -hmm. And so they did get a lot of that. Um, it was a small town. It was, it was, you just weren't conscious. I know mm -hmm. there, there were black people in the town, but I didn't even know where they lived. Or, and I know they had a school, and I didn't know where the school was. And the town had a population of 6,000, and mm -hmm. we still had no consciousness of any of that and I, I've looked back to see if I remembered anything about Jewish people and I don't if there were Jewish people in town I didn't even know who they were so mm -hmm. we weren't very conscious I, or at least the kids weren't I don't know and my parents evidently didn't talk about it because except that day in the car I know that was that was very upsetting that that they that, that was Pearl Harbor that was on the radio mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't remember them talking, and I don't know that I read newspapers very much. So, How did the war affect your family in terms of either the food you were eating or the way you um, got around in terms of transportation or um, in just daily life? Um. I know there was some question about gas, but I don't know that it ever limited us. And food was, yeah, you know, food was became more and more of a problem. A lot of things we didn't have that came in more later, though. Um, towards the end of the war, for me, it, I don't remember it as mm -hmm. as when I was in high school. For example, what were some of the things that you didn't have that? Well, meat became we had the ration books I know those with the stamps and meat uh, was an issue chocolate which I love was was very difficult to get sugar was hard to get seems to me butter was but I don't I'm not real certain mm -hmm. now you brought with you this ration mm -hmm. book from World War two how, right. how does that how does that work what is in a ration book well, there were, they had stamps. They had so many stamps, and you, and you could only use so many stamps a month. And, you know, I don't really remember even which book this was. At, at, the, at the close of the war, I was working in a grocery store, so I dealt more with this mm -hmm. because things were still very short then, and the sugar and the coffee and, I you know, meat was one of them, and chocolate. I'm a t I love chocolate, so that was an issue. But uh, if we got an order, it went under the counter for the regular customers. Mm -hmm. And even the regular customers had to have stamps to get certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so would, would a book then be specified for a certain item, like a sugar book or a meat book? Or I is think it a, so. Or is it a general kind of thing? I think so, because the other little books that I gave you were um, my brother-in-law's books, and they were... Um, They've got different numbers and things, mm -hmm. but that was 60 years ago, and I've kind of forgotten. Mm -hmm, sure. But I know they were important, and I know you, you really, even if you were a good customer at the grocery store, you still had to have your books. You still had to have the stamps. Now, did um, life improve as a result of the war and people going back to work, or was it still... Do you think it was still hard times on the home front? Well, it it, it flipped at that point because um, I had gone to um, I'm trying to switch here because 
I had gone to college for a year and then I was sent to Purdue University by Curtis Wright who built airplanes. Mm -hmm. And they trained us for a year at Purdue and then I went to work in the war plant at in Columbus, Ohio. And then my mom got sick so I went back home. So I got involved again with the food stamps and the groceries mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, things were, you couldn't, you got a, had to go on a list to get a car. And I think when we first went on the list, we were number 3,000 or something in St. Louis to get a car. And you had to, um, appliances were not available. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things you still couldn't get. But I don't, I don't remember, I mean, it was just a fact of life. Mm -hmm. I don't remember resenting it because mm -hmm. it was just part of, part of the war and, and we were, taught and trained and believed that we were, that was our part that we mm -hmm. could do. Mm -hmm. Where where did that come from? Did it come from your teachers or did it come from listening to the radio or how do you think you received that message? Well, I think probably a couple of ways. I think it was promoted by the government a lot, but I think too, we felt it because the girls didn't go to war mm -hmm. and and families basically didn't go to war. And my father was too old to go to war, so my brother was in the service. But basically, we felt we had to do whatever we could to help. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it was just kind of a feeling that you were part of it. Even in high school, we we collected gum wrappers for the foil, and we mm -hmm. and we had scrap metal drives and picked up scrap metal and turned it in because mm -hmm. that was something we could do. Now, how often would those drives occur, and who were you turning the materials into? Well, it was, I think it was basically done through the school, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. where it went from there. But, mm -hmm. but it was used, and, and we went all over asking for metal and picking up scrap metal. And, but it was just kind of fun for us to do that. And, and collecting the gum wrappers was fun, because if you chewed gum, you were doing something for the, <laughs> for the war. So, so um, the only, the only piece when when the war ended, um, well, they had trained us to work on the airplanes, and we moved to Columbus, Ohio. I, I did bring the picture of the of my group, and they trained. Mm -hmm. They tra Curtis Wright trained over five hundred girls because the men were all in service. They had no draftsmen. They had no checkers, so they trained us and. And we went to Columbus to work for them, but the minute the war was over, we were all discharged because the men came home mm -hmm. and the women went home. Mm -hmm. So that that was all right with me, but it was, um, I know some of my friends were really upset by it because mm -hmm. th those were pretty good jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I got affected because my mom got very ill and I, the war hadn't ended. The war in uh, Germany, in Japan, hadn't ended. So, uh, but I had to go home and help my mom, and they wouldn't give me a release from the war job, mm -hmm. even though the doctor wrote a letter and my dad wrote a letter. They still wouldn't accept it, and so I couldn't get a release, which meant that when I went back to St. Louis, that I couldn't get a job, and I did wind up working in a grocery store because my mom had a friend who had a grocery mm -hmm. store. But it but for some of the my friends who who filled the whole time there, I was short of just a month or two. But the ones that stayed to the very end to be chopped off like that and then go home, mm -hmm. it was it was pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. I think there was one of our friends that actually got to stay, but other than that they sent everybody mm -hmm. home. I wanna come back to that in just a minute. Um now, you were in high school when you were recruited to go to Purdue, is that correct? No, you no. had to have a year of college. I, okay. had, I had gone to college. Where did you go to school? I went to Culver Stockton in Canton, Missouri. It's a small private okay. school. We had about 200 girls and 17 boys because there weren't any boys. Mm -hmm. When I went to Purdue, they had, I don't know, they had... Um, they had all kinds of military there. So I think we had 50 or 60 boys to every girl because they 
Purdue was basically a male school except for home ec majors, but we were there in aeronautical engineering. Mm -hmm. So there still weren't that many girls, and they had Navy people, Marines, everybody there because mm -hmm. they were training them too. So it affected campus life a great deal in both schools. I mean, they're just, um, well, it does to a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> now, you were 16 when you were in college and recruited? Uh, no, I was, that was in 40, 44, I would have been 18. I had okay. a year of college. Right. Because they wanted when, to. And when you were in college, did somebody come to your school and recruit people no, in your school? No, they put an ad in the newspaper, uh -huh. and my father found the ad, uh -huh. and what they, and they still didn't have any money, my parents, and so this was a free year at Purdue University, uh -huh. which had a wonderful name. Mm -hmm. And you had to be a math major. You had to have made good grades and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I qualified. So um, I answered the ad and passed the test. And then I got to go to Purdue. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful year. Now, who was it that put the ad in? Was it a government agency? Curtis Wright. Cur oh, Curtis Wright. Okay. Curtis Wright mm -hmm. was building airplanes. Okay. They now, didn't. when you went to Purdue, then you were, what were you studying under? Aeronautical engineering. Okay. So what would be the classes that you would take, for example? I had, uh, we had a lot of drafting because that was what they wanted us to do uh -huh. physically when we got there, but we had every math class they had. We had physics, calculus, analyt, uh -huh. and then we had uh, we had aer aeronautical engineering because w we actually were in wind tunnels and plane, flying air, I mean mock airplanes, uh -huh. and it was it was great. We had the regular university professors, and so we were well trained. Mm -hmm. Now, was it was it intense? In, in other words, did they try yeah. and speed it up for you and give they you did. more? Yeah, we were there uh, from September to March, and we got a full year. Mm -hmm. And and I had mm -hmm. a full year's credit from Purdue. Mm -hmm. It it was very speeded up, mm -hmm. and it was intense, and it was heavy on math and physics. So, we studied. <laughs> but we had a great time too. They even bought us activity passes, so we got to do everything and paid for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for so you also were able to participate in other social activities mm -hmm. with the young men who were yeah. on campus. Yeah, the ball, mm -hmm. all the ball games, and they had they had bands and different things came there. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was a great year. Then when you completed that time in March, then did you go to Columbus to work mm -hmm. in the Curtis Wright factory? Right. Mm -hmm. So when when you got to Columbus, what was the expectation that you would be doing when you were there? Well, we started out in drafting, just just doing. That was back when drafting was done with linen and ink, and mm -hmm. I some I had I had a couple of those saved, but I think I washed them out because it was linen and I could make clothes out of linen. <laughs> but. Um, it was ink, and it, it was real drafting. It wasn't mm -hmm. done on a computer. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, we did that. And then I got promoted. Several of us got promoted to being checkers. And uh, we would check other people's work. Mm -hmm. And then my one friend who did stay, I know, went on up in the company. She was very good. Mm -hmm. My mom actually got pregnant, but mm -hmm. she didn't. Um, that was back in the days when you didn't talk about things mm -hmm. like that, so she just kept writing me letters saying she was sick. And mm -hmm. I'd write back and say, what's wrong? She wouldn't answer me. And then finally my dad said he needed me to come home because I did have two younger mm -hmm. brothers. I had a younger brother and younger sister. So, so I went home, and first thing I asked my mom was what was wrong because I thought she had cancer or something, mm -hmm. and she said she was pregnant. And and I cracked up. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was funny, but um, <laughs> I guess she thought I wouldn't approve or something because they had friends who had the same situation mm -hmm. and the kids moved out. So, But I thought it was wonderful. Now, were you disappointed, though, that you had to come home and give up your, that part your was, work? Yeah, that mm -hmm. part was kind of hard because we were, we, were, yeah, we were enjoying what we were doing mm -hmm. and felt like it was important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the aircraft that you were working on, what was it? was that? the Helldiver, and I, did, I gave you a couple pictures mm -hmm. of that because they've got one hanging at Midway Airport in Chicago mm -hmm. right now 
Well, I guess it's still there. It was there last year. Anyway. So those were fighter fighter they planes. They were fighter planes. And were yeah. they used in both Europe and in Japan or Asia, I should say? I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I would imagine they were. Um, yeah, I'm sure they had to be. We, I, you know, I don't think we thought about what their use was going to be. We were mm -hmm. just doing them for the government, mm -hmm. for our country. Mm -hmm. No, we felt very, very good about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. How many women did you say were? were well, well, they trained 500, but mm -hmm. the group I was with at Purdue was about 35. That, and we lived in a frat house because all the guys were gone. It was a whole different <laughs> world, you know. And, all the boys were gone, so they had the fraternity houses available. And mm -hmm. so we lived in our own frat house, and we got very close. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a reunion a couple of times since that. And uh, um, yeah, and it, it was also intense, as you said, because, you know, analytic geometry and mm -hmm. all the physics courses. I don't, know, I don't know that I remember a thing about them now, but uh, they were hard at the time. But we did well and and had a lot of fun too. Did um, the remaining women who didn't go to Columbus to Curtis Wright? Did they go to other places in the U.S. to work? I think other? we all went to Columbus. Mm -hmm. They had different groups, so uh, because they did about 500 girls, and some of them went to other universities. And mm -hmm. they, uh, but Curtis Wright, the, the plant at Columbus, Ohio, was one of their big plants. Mm -hmm. And evidently, they didn't have any men there to draw, to do the drawings, mm -hmm. and, and they had to have the drawings to build the planes. So, now you you were in your adolescence, and the war was going, was getting underway and going. How did that? And you know, we we kind of think of adolescence as a time which is a little more carefree, and mm -hmm. you have uh, f fun activities as well as going to school. Did that? disappear for you when when you were growing up, do you think? Not exactly. I mean, you didn't have a lot of dates. I mean, uh, there were a few guys that were exempt for one reason or another. And um, But at that time, too, in the dormitories, they were all girls. I mm -hmm. mean, we didn't have mixed dorms. And so you got we got to be very good friends with other women. Mm -hmm. and. That was very important. Mm -hmm. And there were a few guys on campus. I always seemed to have a boyfriend, at least one. And and then the, the my other friends that were in service, they wrote letters back. And so we kept the connection. Mm -hmm. I think we just accepted all of it mm -hmm. much more than I would accept it now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was just, they were, they were the boys were doing what they had to do. And so we, and we, and we enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed being with the girls, mm -hmm. and um, it was just, I think we, I know we accepted, it, just accepted a lot of things that I would not mm -hmm. accept today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Well, I would imagine that some of the things that you have said, for example, being closer with women because of men being in the service, and then also working in a uh, an important position in an airplane plant, um, and this being a, an experience that many women had, how do you think women and yourself, how do you think people felt after the war was over and you had to return to kind of the old way where women were not in, not held in such high esteem? I think at the time it was fine because I grew up and my whole goal in life was to get married and have four children mm -hmm. and and women didn't work outside the home very much, mm -hmm. not, not unless they really had to. And so it was just fine. The guys were all coming home and mm -hmm. that part was all right. I've wondered since that though because I've become very active with women's groups and feminist groups and and very active in anti-war groups mm -hmm. and I've wondered, I think it, some of that had to come from way back there mm -hmm. that um, because it was ugly and it was a bad thing and we did lose friends and and you know look looking back at the time you're just doing it and and it was every, everyone was doing it mm -hmm. and 
So um, I remember my dad was a coach at the high school too, and he lost one of his boys. And I remember that that was a very black time. Mm -hmm. He was killed on one of the islands in the, in the Pacific. And then as each, each, and the, and the boys, I think, were more changed than we were because mm -hmm. they had been in the war. And when they'd come home, things were a little different. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun at Purdue simply because they had all the military there. I mean, we were 50 to 1. I mean, <laughs> so that part, that was good. The year at Culver Stockton, where it was mostly girls, is more where I remember being with. Well, the, no, even in Purdue, we had our own house and, mm -hmm. and we were together. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it, I think it, was kind of a foundation for women friendships and being part of a women's whatever mm -hmm. and um, and I I guess and I don't know if that's true for everybody but I think for me it was just more a matter of this is the world this mm -hmm. is where we were just accepting and this is what we needed to do mm -hmm. and um, I don't remember any anti-war protests or anything. We, we just did it. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you like to talk at all about any of your um, friends or schoolmates who were in the war or about any of the correspondence you had during that period? Mm, I think that probably was boring. I, I, I did write to I mean, I had several boyfriends, and I wrote to them, of course, but I also wrote to some of the other boys that were in our high school just mm -hmm. because we mm -hmm. felt that was something we could mm -hmm. do. But I don't know. I sometimes wondered if our letters were even helpful. I mean, we just wrote, you know, because everyone wrote letters then. I don't mm -hmm. write letters anymore, but, I mean, once in a while. But, but that was... That was the contact we had, mm -hmm. and we didn't have TV, we didn't have emails, we didn't mm -hmm. do telephones, and so we wrote letters. But it was important. We felt it was important to to write mm -hmm. those letters. Mm -hmm. um, th thinking about Germans and Japanese, how do you think? people in the U.S. felt, or maybe people in your town or yourself felt about them during the war and after the war? I don't think, I don't, I don't remember, like I said, I've, I've tried to reconstruct, even mm -hmm. like, I think there was a, a jeweler in our town named Piper, and I thought, well, he might have been Jewish, and I did finally find out where the, the black high school was. Mm -hmm. I just, we didn't do that. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't, somehow it wasn't an issue. And the slogans and things they put on the barns, I think those were just kind of rare things because mm -hmm. a lot of our, a lot of our, my friends were German and, and we weren't, I wasn't that far from being Norwegian and Swedish and mm -hmm. English and whatever, I'm about Heinz 57, but but we all had families that came back, came over here. And mm -hmm. so I don't think, I don't remember, and we didn't have any Japanese in town mm -hmm. being in Missouri, but um, I don't remember any, I really don't remember anybody saying anything mean. It was just, I do remember the stuff that was painted on the barns mm -hmm. and uh, and the and the farm boys too could get exempted from the war, which um, if they were needed on the farm. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the some of the high school boys may have resented that. I don't know. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. my hunch is that that was more. And I may be wrong, but that it was more young men that painted those things. Mm -hmm. um, did you? Were the schools segregated at that time in Missouri? Yeah. Okay. Although my dad's team played, that's the other funny part, my dad's team played the black high school team, mm -hmm. but we still somehow never recognized that it was in town. I mean, it was... Mm -hmm. Very separate? Very separate and, mm -hmm. and not even curious about it and, and never a real issue either. I mean... Um, but we had very little connection, so. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's from the white side of the picture. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. sure. I'm sure it would be a different story for a black kid. Now, <clears throat> when you came back from Columbus, you started working in a store, mm -hmm. and I was wondering. Um, so rationing was rationing still in effect then? Yeah, it was. It went on for for a while, and then, like with the cars, you you signed a list. Mm -hmm. And I think our number, because we had just gotten married, and our number was 2,000 and something in St. Louis, which meant we would be waiting a long time. But my husband had a friend who had a little number, and he didn't need the car, so we got his number. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we could have waited two or three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did get the last piece of satin in St. Louis to, for my wedding dress. Oh. My mom made the wedding dress. Mm -hmm. and. That was after the war, but it was the last piece of satin they had in the in the big department store. Oh my goodness! So there was a, there was there were a lot of things, and we couldn't get nylons. We painted our legs. You probably heard that story with brown goop, and so. <laughs> when did you, when did, were nylons then available? When did they? It was a while mm -hmm. because I know we used that that brown. It was it's almost like. Uh, powder base, you know, you just spread it all over your legs so your legs were brown and looked like you had hose on. And um, I think we used that probably all through co the two years of college. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you were working in the grocery store and there was rationing, would you, would you have to have a ration card to buy everything or was no. it, it was just the items that it you had mentioned, the sugar? And meat and things like that. There were there was quite a list. Mm -hmm. I was trying. I've been trying to remember what all. It seemed like soap was on there, but like laundry soap. But but my boss, it, he, it was a small grocery store, and he just said put and put certain things under the counter for the regular customers, because mm -hmm. people would come into the store and they had the list of the things that they couldn't get, mm -hmm. and that's all they wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, we needed to save it for our good customers and. So we had we had a number of things, and like chocolate might come in every two or three weeks. We'd mm -hmm. get some chocolate, and coffee was. I remember those two particularly that were unavailable. What What does it mean to be a good customer? Is that someone who came in and somebody came in bought? at least other times, uh -huh. or, or if they had come in and bought a bunch of groceries, then I might have been able to offer them, you know. Mm -hmm. Some, but but the people that just came just for the things that were hard to get, uh, he didn't want me to give them to him. So, mm -hmm. do you know if there or were you aware of black marketing? I've heard the word, and I know it must have gone on. I have not nothing mm -hmm. personal mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, I, were people in Missouri? Um, um, were they well acquainted with Senator or Vice President President Truman? Do you know? Since he was from well, we like Truman because he was from Missouri and pretty plain spoken and mm -hmm. seemed to be doing a good job. Um, again, I was six, seventeen, eighteen at that point, mm -hmm. not very knowledgeable, and um, but he was a he was a hometown boy <laughs> sort of thing mm -hmm. and not being too involved uh, but we always voted I mean that was we were good citizens I mean if you meet people from Missouri about that time we were we all tried to be good mm -hmm. and um, the, it was just more a shock to me as as a teenager to have a different president because I just thought it was kind of like King Roosevelt, you know, he, <laughs> he'd been there forever. And uh, do you remember when um, the first atomic bomb was dropped? Uh, did you have any remembrance of that? I'm sure I do, and I, I. Uh, like it is a day that will live in infamy. I mean, I think everyone was shocked over that mm -hmm. and what it meant. And I did get to go back to Japan in 1980 for six weeks on a peace exchange. And 
So that's what the banner that I get showed you was mm -hmm. from. And uh, we talked to the, some of the survivors and um, met a lot of people there, and it, mm -hmm. it was very tragic. Yeah. Where did you travel when you were in Japan? Was that the first time you were there? Was, yeah. Uh -huh. It was, um, well, we started in Hiroshima. Hiroshima, they have a World Friendship Center, and they mm -hmm. had set up a peace exchange with teachers. And at that time, I was school counselor, so that qualified. And um, they brought four, four of us over there. And then the next year, they'd send four Japanese teachers to our country, and they're still doing it. And mm -hmm. um, it was great. We had to pay our own transportation, but they provided housing from people that believed in them. So we stayed in everything from a pig farm to a penthouse to a little one-room tiny apartment in Tokyo. It was, very, it was great. Mm -hmm. A lot of old houses. And, um, and they, all ha they have stories, very definitely. I have stories about the war and about the bombing, and um, that was a very powerful trip. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about any of uh, the uh, survivors of Hiroshima that you met? Right now, my mind is blank. I just know the, the ones that were actually there when the bomb dropped and then we saw the movies, and then they have a mu museum there in Hiroshima that mm -hmm. I came home saying I thought everybody in the world ought to walk through that museum mm -hmm. because the actual aftermath of the damage that the bomb caused is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Holocaust was horrible, but it was a different way. I mean, the and it's a different way, but the bomb was instant, and people just disintegrated, mm -hmm. literally. They have somewhere, they just have shadows where people had been, the, the bodies completely disappeared. They have a lot of, they still have a number of Habaksha who were survivors of, of the dropping of the bomb, mm -hmm. but they're all sickly and um, have been for years. And, to imagine being there with this bomb coming down and wiping out, I've forgotten the number, 300,000 or 500,000 or something like that, people instantly, children in schools and families and a woman in her garden and just gone. It, it was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it accomplished other than creating another weapon of some kind. Well, they claim it ended the war, but I think it could have ended without that. And the one, the second bomb in, in Nagasaki was just testing another bomb and it did the same thing, killed people like that. Just burned them and blasted them. No, I've, I've wondered how much I've wondered how my life and my story have, have affected my whole life because now I'm very much anti-war, anti-racism. I've done, I got my doctorate in peace and justice and it's still number one on my list. So I just, I don't think war, I think war is an evil thing. Would you like to talk about your, your studies and your doctorate and, and how you've used them? Well, I got my doctorate at a seminary, um, Bethany Seminary in Oak Brook, up by Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I did it in Peace and Justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I am an ordained minister, too. I mean, they didn't actually give me any courses in being an ordained minister, but since I did it at mm -hmm. the seminary, I became an ordained minister. And uh, but it it was a, it was a, a pretty again intensive study in peace and justice, and read a lot of readings and writings mm -hmm. about that. No, I just think, and, and we got involved. 
we've been protesting for years. We started with Martin Luther King in the Vietnam War and, and mm -hmm. are still very much against the Iraqi War. And um, I just think there are other answers than war and killing people and better, much better answers. So I've belonged to a lot of different groups and I have spoken many places and um, get in trouble every once in a while. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to talk about, about the war and how it affected your life or the lives of your family or friends? That's a heavy one. I was going to tell you a funny one first. Okay. Um, <laughs> when when my when the man I married, I didn't know him beforehand, but when he came back and um, oh, I had started writing to him because his sister and her husband were good customers at the grocery store, and they mm -hmm. said I I should write to their brother and. I, Actually, some of the other customers did that too. So I wrote letters there. I would, I wrote a lot of letters. But uh, when he came back from service, uh, we decided we liked each other. And he had been in the Navy Air Corps. He was a pilot in the Navy Air Corps. And but we didn't have a car of any kind. He didn't have a car of any kind. My family had one car. So, um, but his his stepfather had a. a old truck, a panel truck of some kind. He was a painter and he had one seat in it and then he could put a box in it so somebody could be a passenger. No seat belts, just mm -hmm. a box you could sit on. So we went to the Chase Hotel one time for something very special. It was the, it was the high spot in St. Louis at the time. So I got all dressed up and we went down in this panel truck and I sat on the box. It was like a wooden milk carton box all dressed up and we pull up at the Chase Hotel and give it to the man to park the car. <laughs> we always thought that was a funny story because I, I can't imagine anyone doing that now but at the time nobody had cars and so you got there however you could. So. Now did your romance with your future husband begin through your correspondence do you think? Um, Sort of, although it was just another letter. Mm -hmm. I mean, but when he came back, um, when he came back, then we went out, and um, I think he proposed on the third date, and we were married three months later, and we've been married 61 years, and have four children. So, so you got your four children. I got my. Four, <laughs> I got married. I have my four <laughs> children. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to talk about? Um, I don't know, this has been interesting because I'm sure you're aware too that you do forget lots of things. And mm -hmm. so I've been, since, since this was set up, I've been trying to remember and a lot of it I really don't remember a lot mm -hmm. of details. Mm -hmm. But the things that I do remember um, are kind of fun to remember mm -hmm. and, and kind of put my life back together a little bit in different ways. That those those things were part of my life and probably did affect a lot of what, mm -hmm. where I am now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Weber.